Hey everyone, it's Mr. Mendes. Uh, so I decided to kind of uh, help you guys with your history assignments on the Google Classroom. And in order for me to do that, um, I'm actually going to be going through the Google Slides that are on there. So for this particular lesson, it's going to be for Chapter 8, Greek Civilization. Now, normally, and the hopes would be that, you know, once everyone gets on Google Classroom, we can have a whole Hangout session. Uh, so we could talk about the assignment uh, and the Google Slides themselves, kind of like a study session between us uh, on the computer. But in the meantime, I think the best way for us to do is for me to go through these Google Slides, one, so I can read them so you guys understand what's going on, and two, to add a little bit more information to it, I'll add a little bit more meat to what exactly you're learning in this chapter, okay? So if you want to follow along, this is chapter eight of Greek civilization. Uh, now, the first lesson of this chapter is lesson one, Greek culture. And we kind of already talked about this in our classroom uh, in the last chapter when we we're just talking about where exactly Greece is. Uh, because lesson one deals with, um, you know, their, their writing, their religion, how they lived, uh, the type of gods and goddesses that they used to focus on. Uh, their building, their math, you know, different things like that. So yeah, this is lesson one, and you can follow along. Um, so this is the Greek beliefs. The first thing you got to know is that unlike uh, the Israelites that we studied in a different chapter, uh, the Greeks were polytheistic, meaning they believed in more than one god, just like the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians uh, and the Romans early on that the seventh graders have been learning. Um, so yeah, they believed in more than one God, and they also, the majority of them also spoke around the same language. Um, and because they spoke around the same language and they had a shared belief religion, it was very easy to form an identity in a culture because they knew, oh, you believe in that God? You believe in that goddess? Oh, me too. All right, then we both are part of the same tribe. We're both part of the same community, the same city-state. Um, and because of this polytheism, uh, they saw that these gods and goddesses had, had powers that controlled pretty much everything that happened in nature around them. Um, but they looked like humans. They weren't like these weird looking creatures. That, that's not to say there weren't creatures in, in uh, Greek mythology, but the main gods just looked like regular humans. That's why, you know, whenever they did a statue of a god or a goddess or even a hero in their mythology, you saw every single thing that was very much like a human being, like their arms, their legs, their body, uh, their torso, different things like that. Um, so yeah, the, the 12 most important gods and goddesses lived on Mount Olympus. This is actually a real mountain in the, uh, the peninsula of, of Greece, except during that time, this mountain was always covered by mist and clouds, and they kind of saw that as like a barrier that the, that the gods would create in order to make sure they're hidden or protected from the from the regular humans. Um, it's actually the, the highest mountain in, in Greece. Um, so some of the few gods that I'll go into are Zeus, who is the chief, the main god, uh, the god of thunder and the god of lightning. Now, normally people think that he just has the power of lightning, that like he could just kind of be like Thor and uses, you know, uses hammer and summon lightning out of nowhere. But in actuality, his powers are tied to other characters, other people, in Greek mythology. So his uh, lightning bolts were actually created by other characters in Greek mythology. So once he ran out, he ran out. So he had to make sure to work with those people, those uh, those lightning bolt smiths. Uh, the next god is Athena, who was the goddess of wisdom and crafts. Then it's followed by Apollo, who's a sun god and also the, the god of poetry. Uh, Aphrodite, who was the, the goddess of love. Ares, the god of war, Poseidon, the gods of the seas, and the god that would be responsible for earthquakes. Um, and you have Hades, the god of the underworld. And something that you guys will realize, and you guys kind of already realized this when we were kind of learning the different gods in our textbooks and the stories that we read to you guys, is that they were all related. They were either brothers or sisters or sons or daughters. Um, they all had some sort of relation to each other. Um, some pretty weird, other ones, things that we're kind of used to now. Um, and another thing is that 
a lot of the go- these gods and their powers and what they were in charge of they were kind of the same in the sense that um, they were kind of seen as the god of war in a sense. Like, yeah, Zeus was the chief god and the god of thunder, but he was also had warlike powers. Athena was the goddess of wisdom and crafts, but she also had warlike powers. Um, Ares is literally the god of war. Hades is the god of the underworld, but also had like warlike power. So they had all a sense of power, might just so they could back up their their belief. Uh, and then moving on, uh, if you go through the slides, you'll see a couple photos of the uh, the gods and goddesses I just mentioned. But moving on is uh, the oracles. Now, something very important to Greek mythology is that the Greeks believed that each person had a fate or a destiny that they had to follow, or it was already created for them. Um, and so you hear this in a lot of stories and a lot of fables and epics that the Greeks would visit oracles who are basically these prophets or these future tellers, uh, to get a prediction or get a clue, or get a kind of like a little insight and messages from the gods to see what was, uh, going to happen to them in the future, their, their own destiny. Uh, one of the most notable of these oracles was at the temple of Apollo at Delphi, which, uh, there was an oracle chamber that was deep inside the the, the temple. Um, and something you got to understand is the Greeks like to take advantage of the nature and environment around them. And so in order to kind of show that, oh, yes, they were connected to the gods and they had all these powers and they were seen as these wizards and witches during that time, um, the temple where they built was actually near uh, a volcanic vent or a steam vent. So you had all this steam and gas coming out, which kind of created this like sense of illusion. Uh, so that temple of Apollo, the, the room where the oracle would be in, where she would be in, uh, had an opening in the floor where volcanic smoke and steam would hiss from a crack in the earth, which kind of showed, it kind of like, created this sense of like mystery so it's kind of like going to a place or to a a, a magic show and i don't know where this magi- uh, magician comes out and there's steam or smoke around them you kind of when you're younger you kind of have that sense of like oh what's going on this person must have powers same thing back then they kind of took advantage of what happened back then to kind of show that they have some sort of connection to the gods uh same thing with earthquakes you know if someone wanted to say oh I am a son or daughter or granddaughter or descendant of uh, of Poseidon. Uh, I am able to uh, control earthquakes. They would either wait until an actual earthquake happened uh, and then say, oh, yeah, I did that. Or they would find a way to kind of shake either the building the gra- or the area that they were around uh, as to, one, to trick people, but two, to show that, yes, I am connected to the gods, so you should respect me and, um, I have this higher power. Uh, the next things, oh, that was my phone. The next things are epics and fables. Now, we haven't read a lot of epics and fables in our class. The only ones that we have is whenever we have read the story of Hercules or Odysseus or the Iliad. But uh, Greek stories have influenced many civilizations around the world. Like, there's so many shows and movies that we have seen. Uh, growing up that are related to it because um, they have some sort of uh, relation to it. So you have two things. You have epics and you have fables. Epics are usually the ones that were filled with so much action and there was consequences whenever someone did something bad. Uh, the gods were always trying to mess with the humans and trying to, trying to use humans as, as a game for the gods to get some sort of enjoyment. Um Two of the most famous ep- epics that were created uh, by the Greeks were written by uh, an individual called Homer during the seven, uh, 700s uh, about the war between Greece and another city-state called Troy. And those two epics are called the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, in order to get a little bit more information about those, I suggest going on the Google Slides. There's YouTube links that are connected to them, the Iliad and the Odyssey. The reason why I won't go too into it too much it's just because they would take a very, very, very long time. And I want to make sure you guys explore how to use the YouTube and, and uh, the Google Slides on the Google Classroom. So please look those uh, videos up so you can kind of get a sense of it. All right. Uh, the next thing, uh, like I said, were fables. Now, fables are short tales or short stories 
that usually teaches a lesson. You know, growing up, you might have heard something from your grandparents or, or your, your parents or your guardians saying, oh, there's a story about this person that did this thing. And in the end, they end up getting in trouble or something awesome happened. Um, and it was kind of meant to teach you a lesson or to show you consequences. Or if you did something bad, bad things going to happen. If you did something good, good things are going to happen. That's basically what a fable is. And most of you guys have probably heard or read uh, a couple fables uh, during school. One of the most famous is the hare and the tortoise or the rabbit or the rabbit and the turtle. Um, and most of you guys already know the story, you know, uh, the turtle and the rabbit get into a race and the rabbit thinks he's so cool because he, he can run faster than, than the turtle. So the rabbit's running and running and running and then he, they see that, oh, I'm ahead by so much. I'll just take a nap and the turtle won't even catch up. And so the rabbit takes a nap, knocks out, forgets about the, the race. Uh, and so the turtle is able to catch up and actually finishes and beats the rabbit in the race. Then that short story is basically uh, trying to tell you, hey, take things slow. Don't rush. Uh, learn how you're, what's going on around you and you will succeed. Not rush into something, not caring what's going on, and you're just going to forget about what you wanted to do. So, yeah, that's a very famous uh, uh, fable. Uh, another fable are like the fox and the grapes and the boy who cried wolf. Most of you guys have heard or should have heard the story of the boy who cried wolf. Um, but it's, it's essentially is a story that is meant to show you something, to teach you a lesson. Uh, the next slide is the impact of Greek drama. Now, uh, I've had some people ask me what exactly is the difference between a comedy and a drama. When we think about movies and shows now, yeah, there's a difference. You know, comedies, you're usually, oh, let's have fun. There's laugh. There's laughing, there's excitement, there's jokes, uh, and drama is usually like a serious thing, there's sadness, you know, things like that. But when it came to Greek culture, drama was actually a form of entertainment. It was a form of theater. So drama is a story told mainly through the words and actions of a cast of characters. So it was basically kind of a play, something that you guys might have seen at the at the hotel when we when we saw the the musical or the, the play of the Billy Goat's Gruff. Um, but there was two types, two types of drama, tragedy and comedy. Now, tragedy usually involved main characters that were str like struggling, having a hard time to do something or overcome a hardship, and they usually did not succeed. It was usually a story of, I need to try harder, I need to try harder, and at the end, it just didn't work out. And usually, people really like those type of tragedies because they wanted to show how far can a person go to succeed, but still see how, no matter how much they tried, they could still fail at whatever they did. So that's a tragedy. The next one, the next type of drama is a comedy. Now, it's not something that you're laughing all the time. You're like, ha, 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 this is hilarious. A comedy is just any story that ended in a happy ending. So, uh, you know, I guess the three little pigs could be an example of a comedy because it's funny throughout the whole thing in a sense. But in the end, there is a happy ending for the last pig because he got away. I mean, it's not really a happy ending for the other pigs because they ended up being eaten by the wolf. But it's still a happy ending for that last pig. Um, but the thing you have to know about those two types of drama is that within Greek culture, men usually were the ones who played all the characters. Like there was hardly any women in it. Um, if there was a creature or a woman or a really old woman or an old man or a god or goddess or an animal, whatever, they usually, men usually had to pay, play those characters or those people, uh, either by wearing masks or costumes or makeup, paint and stuff like that. So if there was a woman in, in a story, usually a man had to play it. And so women didn't really participate in theater that much, unfortunately, um, just because you know, in Greek cult culture, usually in Athenian culture, in, a, in the city-state of Athens, men usually had the, had more rights than women. Uh, that's not to say all city-states in Greece were like that. You guys should already know that in Sparta, women had more rights than men just because the men were so busy going off to war and uh, spending time in the barracks, training, getting ready to fight. 
well, women just basically did whatever they wanted to because the men weren't around to ruin the fun. Um, so yeah, uh, going back to, to drama, uh, four of the greatest writers that we know in, in Greek mythology, uh, not Greek mythology, Greek uh, culture can be seen in that Google slide, uh, the impact of Greek drama. Now, I'm not going to say it right now just because I'll probably butcher it. I'll mess up the names. Uh, Greek could be very, Greek names could be very hard to pronounce. Um, so don't worry if you can't get it the first try. Um, and the last one for lesson one is Greek art and architecture. And what you got to know is that both Greek art and architecture, architecture meaning how does a building look like, how do people build stuff, um, has impacted the world around us, like how we build stuff now today. Um, every Greek city or city-state had a temple dedicated to a god or goddess. So they had a temple for Zeus, had a temple for Apollo, for Hades, for Ares, things like that. One of the most famous one, and you'll see it on that Google slide, is the Parthenon, not the uh, Pantheon, the Parthenon. Now there's a difference between Parthenon and Pantheon. Parthenon was the original one built by the Greeks. Now, if you visit, visit it now, it looks pretty much looks destroyed. It's still up in a sense because you can still visit visit it and see it and take photos and, and walk around and stuff, stuff like that. But that's the Greek one, Parthenon. When the Romans later on came by and saw all the cool things that the Greeks were doing, they're like, huh, <clears throat> I'm going to copy that. I really like that. So they built almost like an exact copy called the Pantheon. So it's really important to know the difference between those two. Parthenon, Greek, Pantheon, Roman. Um, but going back to the slides, the most famous temple that they have is the Parthenon. And the thing that you could see if you look at the uh, that, that those two photos on um, the Greek art and architecture slide is that the Parthenon have these really tall columns. They're made out of stone and marble. It's very beautiful. It looks like they carved it. And if you really pay attention to it, it the way it's built looks exactly how office buildings or um, big important buildings are built in Washington, D.C. or in state capitals like Boise, Sacramento, um, you know, Iowa City. Uh, again, I said Washington, D.C. Because a lot of their buildings, they kind of look very like... Like, they look like places of importance. And that's essentially what those temples were. They focused a lot of time in building those nice looking temples. They looked beautiful uh, because they wanted to show that was a place of importance. Same thing with now. When, when Usually when a city or a state wants to show that a building or a place is important, um, usually those buildings have like these columns that are coming down the building and it, they're usually made out of stone or concrete, sometimes marble if they're, if they're fancy. Um, but yeah, you see a lot of that stuff, not just here in the U.S. You see that a lot all over the uh, all over the world, particularly in Europe, uh, because a lot of Europeans in the ancient world very much enjoy the art and the architecture that the Greeks were doing, a lot of it. Um, and another thing that the Greeks were really known for and... Uh, it would actually change how we do art today during the Renaissance. Uh, artists from Europe, artists from North America, all over the world, is that the Greeks were in love with the human body. And I'm not saying, ooh, look at his arms or whatever. I'm talking about how the Greeks, they, they really paid attention and they really loved how the human body is so complicated. It's so complex. There's so many things that is going around. If you look at your hand, you know, you really have to pay attention to how your skin looks like, how your nails, your bones, how your muscles work inside your body, your tendons, the 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 strings that are connected to your body. How is it that blood's able to go through your hand and go back out? The Greeks were so amazed by how the human body worked that that's all they focused on. The human body was their favorite subject for a lot of Greek artists. And you see that a lot when you look at Greek sculptures or paintings. Paintings are a little bit different because, you know, they didn't really have a lot of tools for painting. But for sculptures, for statues, their 
art was just amazing. They tried to show the perfect human being. And during that time, the perfect human being, if it was a male, if it was a man, and they were this man of power, they usually seen as very muscular and tall and very powerful looking. We have examples of Zeus or Hercules where, you know, they're not seen as small and scrawny. They're seen as really big, powerful men. And then when it came to the women, they were trying to show how beautiful the human body was. And as you have seen in our classrooms, most of the statues and paintings are of naked men and women because they weren't ashamed. They knew that, yes, they were naked, but that's what they were. You know, you have to show and respect what the human body is in order for you to know what your own body is. And so you could be able to do, uh, create these beautiful sculptures and statues. Um, and we still see that today. You know, when people want to honor a soldier, or honor someone, they usually make a, a statue, whether they're on a horse or like a bust, meaning it's only showing like the neck up, um, like one of those like uh, head sculptures. Um, and they try to make it very detailed as possible, making sure you see dimples and lips and eyes and the pieces of hair and things like that. And a lot of it comes from Greek culture. And that, that's to say that other cultures haven't done it. It's just that uh, when it comes to modern education, we focus a lot on Greek culture. And, and because the Romans really loved Greek culture, they copied the Greeks and the Romans because they had a, unit, a, a huge empire. They spread it all over Europe, parts of Asia, parts of Africa. Um, and all those cultures that were affected by it ended up copying as well. So it was kind of like a photocopy again and again and again. So yeah, that is the end of lesson one. Now, the thing about this video is that you could play it back, uh, listen, to the, uh, listen to the video while you go through the Google Slides. I recommend doing that just so you know which pictures I'm talking about, the examples I'm talking about, and you can see the different lines of text that I'm actually reading from, all right? Uh, remember, if you have any questions, please feel free to type that out in the stream part of your Google Classroom. Uh, this video is just gonna be, this video is just for sixth graders for uh, sixth grade world history. All right, there's gonna be another video coming out for lessons two, three, and four. But I don't want to make these videos too long, uh, doing all those lessons. So I'm gonna kind of like split them up. All right, I uh, hope you guys are doing well, and I hope you like the video.